Hello, I'm Andy Agathangelo. I'm the founder of the Transparency Task Force. The Transparency Task Force is a certified social enterprise with a mission. Uh, our mission is to reform the way the financial industry works. And we're doing that through becoming increasingly focused on the failures of the regulators who are meant to be governing the way the financial system works. This is a particularly important transparency task force event. What's it about? It's about the truth. It's about the truth. There are two very competing versions of the truth in relation to Blackmore Bond. There's the version of the truth being put out by the Financial Conduct Authority. And there's the version of the truth that we, the Transparency Task Force, believes is supported by the evidence available. We're all grown ups. We know there can't be two versions of the same truth. So the reality is that one of these versions of the truth is the truth, and one of them isn't. So here I am talking to you all about the idea that the Financial Conduct Authority is either accidentally or possibly deliberately peddling a false narrative about Blackmore Bond. And the purpose of tonight's session is to try to establish what the truth really is. Our speaker is Paul Carlier. Many of you know Paul already. Uh, Paul is somebody I've learned over several years now to like and admire. Um, Paul has some remarkable characteristics, and I really do mean this, some remarkably wonderful characteristics, a, a passion for the truth that you very, very rarely see. You very, very rarely see. A capacity to do things on a purely voluntary basis because they're the right thing to do and because he wants to help people. And on top of all that, he just happens to have a profound level of subject matter expertise in relation to Blackmore Bond and many, many other issues that have become of enormous interest to the Transparency Task Force. I could honestly say that with people like Paul Carlier and Mark Bishop and others, uh, the Transparency Task Force has actually got a chance to make a real difference. And you all understand the TTF well enough to know that all we're trying to do is get the truth out in the open. Sunlight is the best disinfectant. When I began the Transparency Task Force in 2015, I never, ever, ever thought I'd be running an event all about the idea, the idea that the UK's primary conduct regulator isn't being honest. And the reason I paused this then is because I momentarily I said to myself, how shall I, how shall I go? How, how far shall I go with this? And rightly or wrongly, I come to the conclusion that I just want to speak from the heart. I really do just want to speak from the heart and tell it exactly as I see it. And what I see, ladies and gentlemen, is a regulator that got it horribly wrong, that instead of having the honour and the integrity to say, we got this wrong, what can we do to work together to put it right? And I'm sorry, and let's really do what we can to prevent it from happening again. Instead of doing that, they're doing something different. And they are quite literally attempting to persuade senior members of HM Treasury and parliamentarians that their narrative is accurate and is not misleading. And we want to challenge that. But I'll also say this to the FCA and to the Treasury and to the government that 
if the transparency task force has got it wrong, if Paul's insights and experience are wrong, then tell us. Tell us how and tell us why. Educate us. Show us where we're wrong. And until or unless that happens, we are going to assume and believe that we are right because we absolutely do believe that we are right. And Paul is remarkably well placed to explain all that. And he'll be doing it very shortly. There's a couple of specific things I want everybody to understand. Over the last year or so, we have really learned as a campaign group about the power of the media and about the power of parliamentary engagement. We know there are dozens and dozens and dozens of MPs who are unimpressed with the regulatory framework. Many of them have literally said words to the effect that they don't rate or trust the FCA's competence. They've said it in, in Parliament. The reason I mention this is because tonight's event is part of a strategic plan of attack. The event is being recorded. The recording is going to go to senior people at HM Treasury. It's also going to be made available as part of a programme of activity that you can all choose to um, buy into if you want. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to attempt to show you all what we are planning to do. He says, let me now go to the right email. Here we go. Can you all see my screen? Yeah, can you all see a screen? Thank you, cheers. Ian, yeah. nice big thumbs up there. Thanks, Joan. Okay, so what you're about to see is going to be made available to download from the Transparency Task Force's website sometime tomorrow morning we'll do it as soon as we can it's pretty well written in the sense that it's straightforward it's there's no unnecessary complication and the idea is this as many of you as possible write to your mp about tonight's session make your member of parliament aware that you share our concerns about whether the fca is peddling a false narrative about blackmore bond so here we go. We'll go through this together. Instructions. Number one, if you don't already have them, you can find details of your MP and his or her email address here. You click on the link and you'll get to a page that you can use to find your MP's details. Number two, be sure to adjust the wording below to deal with the content in square brackets. For example, remove the bits about including myself if it doesn't apply to you. Number three. You can, of course, adjust the wording further if you wish, but make sure what you send is factually correct. Also, when you send the email to your MP, copy in Alexandra Zipkus, my colleague, our head of events, who's organised tonight's event, so we can keep track of progress. Here's what you would be writing, adjusted as you wish. Dear Fred Bloggs, my MP, I hope you're well. I am one of your constituents, my address and postcode is, you must put your postcode in there, okay? I am writing to express my, my serious concern that many individuals, and obviously include including myself if it applies to you, many individuals including myself have lost money due to the Blackmore Bond scandal and the catastrophic regulatory failure at the heart of it. The Blackmore Bond scandal was the subject of a BBC Panorama documentary broadcast in August last year, see here, and it takes you to the YouTube link that obviously shows the Panorama program. There has been extensive criticism from many stakeholders, including parliamentarians, about the way the Financial Conduct Authority has handled the matter. Many people believe that had the FCA acted when they should, they would not have been scammed. I'm writing to you today because I'm aware the Campaign Group Transparency Task Force is convinced that the Financial Conduct Authority has been trying to convince senior members of HM Treasury and various parliamentarians that they are blameless in relation to Blackmore Bond. They, that being the Transparency Task Force, they don't believe that to be the case, and quite frankly, nor do I. 
I would urge you please to watch in full the video recording that you can access through the link below. It provides a compare contrast analysis between what the Financial Conduct Authority is claiming and what the evidence actually shows. I believe this to be a very serious matter that impacts thousands of individuals. It undermines the trust and confidence in the financial services sector as a whole and the regulatory framework that is meant to be governing it. Please let me know what you think about the evidence shared in the video and as my MP, what you can do to help the call for transparency, fairness and justice. Click here to watch the video recording and obviously we'll be putting a link into it. I look forward to hearing from you soon, kind, re kind regards, then your name. So you'll all be given access to that. So you can download and send it once we've got the, um, the video link incorporated into it. Now, during the session, I'm going to be giving you all a link in the chat to that wording. If any of you want to suggest improvements to the wording, feel free to do so. By the end of tonight, there may be some comments in there that we can use to improve the way the wording goes. And the plan is that hopefully a dozen or two or maybe more MPs get that, um, get that video with a letter. And they then ask challenging questions of the FCA, either directly or through Treasury or the Treasury Select Committee or some other such body to really try to establish which is the true version of the truth. So this is serious stuff, folks. This is serious stuff. We're calling out a regulator. And that ain't easy. And it takes a bit of courage and it takes a bit of conviction and we're doing it for the right reasons. Um, like many of you, I'm fed up um, people losing serious amounts of money because other people aren't doing their job properly. And you know what? Just before I pass over to Paul, we really do think this is beyond what we call innocent incompetence. This isn't just people getting it wrong. This is something more worrying than that dare I say it, more sinister than that. Folks, the very next thing we're going to do is show our appreciation to Paul Carlier, who, as always, has put a lot of time and effort into preparing this session. Uh, Paul's got so much to share. I know his challenge is going to be getting it all done by roughly 20 past seven, so that will give us a bit of time, Paul, to have a bit of a catch-up before we wrap up at half past seven. I really don't want it to go beyond half past seven because... Um, it's going to be a challenge getting MPs to watch an hour and a half's worth of video, let alone anything beyond that. So somehow, folks, let's all be as concise as possible. Before we do anything else, let's show our appreciation to Paul Carlier, who once again has uh, put his time and effort into trying to help the cause in such a brilliant way. Mr. Carlier, well done. We salute you. Thank you very, very much. Paul, over to you. Uh, you've got the stage. Make the most of it. 20 past seven. We're going to cut you off wherever you've got to. OK, wherever you've got to, we'll cut you off from there. And um, let's make the most of the time that we've got. You've got just under an hour to whack it all in there, Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, I'm going to just share my screen. Um, can you can you all see that? We can see the screen, and if you click on um, right. slideshow, you'll be exactly where you want to be. Perfect, Paul. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Okay, so now what I've done here, I've, I've included because obviously we're now doing this as almost a direct rebuttal to for the benefit of HM Treasury and and the Treasury Select Committee. So I've included uh, quite a number of slides from previous ones <laughs> just to give a bit of background. So I'm going to skirt through them so that um, you know we have. Hang on, let me just stir uh, find me button. So skirt through them so that it's there, it's on the record, and we can recap. One, so basically this is dedicated to um I've called it the FCA's dishonesty double down since Panorama. I really expected the FCA, once Panorama went out, to finally go, okay, fair cop, we dropped the ball, pick the ball up, and you know, properly investigate and make sure people got the victims got proper remedy. The opposites happened and the best way to describe it is a dishonesty double down since and this is the purpose of this is to bring everyone up to speed so i'm going to whiz through again i don't make an allegation as i've got the evidence to back it up and what you're going to see today and the reason why there's so many slides is because i want to make sure the evidence is there so it's irrefutable nobody can challenge it so i'm going to skirt through these ones here um you know blackmore bond collapses yada 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 
this is a key thing. Neither Blackmore Bond or its mini bonds are regulated by the FCA. This was a major thing that they put out uh, the moment it collapsed. Um, and th this is something that, that they all ignored. So they're talking about the bonds were, were, were not regulated. What I and others reported, and when you see my emails in March 2017, I'm not talking about the product. I'm talking about the fact that this is being marketed and sold to non-sophisticated investors. They're being lied to. They're being told it's guaranteed by one of the world's largest banks, and they're having their sophistication ma manipulated. They are, and I'm quoting it word for word, what I'm hearing next door to us. We will put you down as sophisticated. So they're manipulating the sophistication with one purpose, to circumvent FISMA and COBS. Now, FISMA and COBS both prohibit the sale of um, unregulated investment products to non-sophisticated investors, right? So that's, that's the key thing that I and others were reporting. Why were we doing it? Because we're all professionals. We know that that's a breach of FISMA and COBS. And that's what, where it brings it squarely into the center of the FCA's um, perimeter authority and powers. So these are just a couple of things that uh, Dame Gloucester referred to, self-certification, wrong, etc. cetera. Um, and you know, again, this is the FISMA and, uh, and FCA codes that apply, as you can see there. You know, it's prohibited to sell all this non-regulated investment products to non-sophisticated individuals. I'm sorry if I'm rushing, but I really want to just uh, squeeze through. So, and the FCA was ignoring this part. When they were dishing out representations, they were ignoring that this was the key thing. And to market or sell any non-regulated investment product to non-sophisticated investors is a breach of the COBS, breach of, it, of FISMA, and it is to carry on, therefore, a regulated activity without the permissions to do so. This is what falls within the FCA scope perimeter and mandate, and it applies more so if the firm doing it is themselves not regulated, because the whole purpose of the regulation or the act is to make sure these firms get regulated to outlaw the cowboys and don't let them in. That's the whole point. So it applies more so to non-regulated firms. So um, I'm going to whisk through some of these um, products absolutely within the perimeter. Again, more stuff here that the... Um, uh, uh, the, from Dame Gloucester's report, um, you know, about what they did, what they didn't do, and, and various failures. Um, now, this is the FCA's response. That sh Dame Gloucester pointed out that there was evidence that people were being coached to put themselves down as sophisticated. This is what I'm talking about in terms of manipulation of sophistication. Um, and this is the FCA's response. They don't deny that that's an offence, right? So, but what they do say is that this type of practice can be difficult for us to identify and stop. And that is where, that's what galls me probably the most about those initial things from the FCA and, and Gloucester, um, because I was telling them where we were. I was telling them where we were, the office next door to us, where this is going on, exactly what they said it's difficult to identify and stop. So I'm just going to go through these. As you can see, you know, I'm liaising with the FCA in March 2017. I think I'm helping the FCA. And I'm saying here, please stress whoever you pass this up to and escalate this to, pensioners are being targeted, right? I can't be any more specific than that. And I'm assured it will, they will do. Again, giving out some of the pitch that was being, we were hearing next door. This is like real time intelligence. And they know where we are, we're next door. And this is what the offices look like. So you can see, we could hear and see everything that was going on next door. And it, this, is, this should have been the worst nightmare for this, this boiler room. Right. They set up next to a, a team of highly experienced financial market professionals. And it, it, but instead of being their worst nightmare, we may have been a, a nursery or preschool set up next door for all the good it did. We were reporting stuff in real time and it made not a, not a jot of difference. So um, and this is where the escalation to Mark Stewart and Andrew Bailey, when I discovered this outfit still operating, you know, a year and a half after my initial reports um so I'm, i'd say this is just skirting through it but this is important and i want to come back to this later mark stewart on 21st september 2018 confirms we've received reports and we're making inquiries so but just bookmark this bait this is when the fca started making inquiries okay so that's the, the start date of their investigation i say to them don't apologize to me you know i'm the one being conned out of their pensions now, this is an MOU between City of London Police and the FCA. I, I'm just going to skirt through it, but it basically establishes that they share information with each other, yada, 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 and, you know, um, things that fall out of their scope, all of this kind of stuff. Um, and 
you can see the FCA it's signed by Mark Stewart and it's signed in March 17, the very month where um, I make my reports. This is just a new version. So there was one that was in place before it. So this is another uh, report from an IFA, an FCA authorized IFA who reports Blackmore Bond and the two directors. And again, focusing on the sophisticated issues and the fact that this is potentially a scam, they're guaranteeing the investments and, and everything else refers to prior history of these two uh, directors, Nana McCreesh, and I'm calling them now fraudsters and scammers because they are all the evidence I've got. I can back that up with. OK, so um, and he 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 basically goes through the whole cabal and again refers to FCA, Cobbs, et cetera, et cetera. So, again, all squarely within the uh, perimeter of the FCA. And he goes on to, to say at the end, um, oh, actually, there's, there's a part where this is what and he highlights the powers that the FCA has in this instance, go into Blackmore Bond, order them to immediately close to new investment and the self-certification. It's not enough as per FCA COPS 4.1. So you, you can mandate the firm and compel them to prove to you the due diligence and KYC they've undertaken to establish that this person's sophisticated. Self-certification was outlawed and prohibited by the FCA in 2016. So it's all there. And he points out that the... The damage to the FCA's reputation, if they if Blackmore Bonds defaults to the FCA, could be could be incredibly damaging. And you know, obviously we know that that is the case. So um again, I'm just going to skirt through this because it's uh but th this is quite important that um Stewart says that this is a statement by Mark Stewart. The FCA Gary reminds consumers not to invest in schemes being offered by firms that are not authorized by the FCA and they look too good to be true, like these ones. This is referring to another scam because it will inevitably collapse. So he's, he knows. Now, the FCA has taken, I'm, I'm including these links here, and I will share the deck afterwards so you, you can click the links and you can expand on these. These are all examples where the FCA took action and, and took exercised the powers they had in respect mm -hmm. to non-authorized and non-regulated firms selling non-regulated uh, non investment products. So it's nonsense and it's false for them to claim they had no powers. Indeed, in 2018, in the bottom here, you can see that they actually bought and secured five fraud convictions against people. The FCA did this, not the police. The FCA bought five fraud uh, uh, prosecutions against five individuals, none of whom were authorised or regulated, all of whom were involved in selling non-regulated investment products, exactly as per Blackmore Bond. So they did have the powers. Um, with all of these, there seems to be a commonality. Where they take action, it appears to be where they haven't dropped the ball before. And obviously, Blackmore Bond, they absolutely dropped the ball and then they treated it differently because they're more worried about their own reputation. So, um, but this is the press release by Mark Stewart following those convictions. You know, he says these fraudsters callously targeted investors who are often elderly and vulnerable, you know, lying them to, to get to them to part with significant sums of money. Uh, and yet, all this exactly as I reported, they were targeting vulnerable pensioners. So, Steward here and the FCA admits that they know pensioners are vulnerable and they are therefore owed a much greater duty of care by the FCA because of their because they're vulnerable. There's vulnerabilities all over FCA, COBS, PRIN and everything that, you know, they vulnerable people need more protection and the FCA has the powers to act. So, <clears throat> again, but here again, I, I want to skirt through, but this is important. August 19, I find this mob still operating. I report it again. So, um here it is. I report it to, to Mark Stewart um, and list all the things that we'd, we'd raised earlier. Um, and I don't want to go over that uh, in, in too much detail. Um, the but the FCA is still coming out with we don't have power to investigate a firm that is is unauthorized and not carrying out any regulated activities, even if there are circumstances that suggest there may be fraud, which is completely false as proven by the fraud prosecutions the FCA bought. So. Um, Moving on, um, this was something that Alison Thewlis of the Treasury Set Committee asked Andrew Bailey regarding LCNF. Uh, Duke set to the possibility had the contact centres been clearer and adequate escalation to the relevant departments, the customers would have uh, suffered less detriment. Bailey said yes. Well, that Blackmore Bond proves that that's nonsense because they knew about Blackmore Bond before they knew about LCNF. And they knew about Blackmore Bond three years before its collapse and still the, the outcome was the same. People lost everything. Um, now, and one thing that Blackmore Bond highlights that um, is that the FCA claim that all 600 reports to the FCA about 
um, LCNF never made it out of the contact centres. However, the evidence I've got, not that shows that not just mine, but every report about Blackmore Bond made it out of the contact centres to the relevant department. How and that they, they ran in parallel. How does that occur? And it begs the question: Did the FCA doctor the the documentary record to conceal that? And I refer you to John Swift QC, oh, and now Casey, and Dame Gloucester, who both raised serious concerns about the keeping of the contemporary records by the FCA and, and records that were missing. And he and the FCA even re, uh, admitted to him that their record keeping was poor. Poor? There's a fine line between poor and, um, and dishonest, shall we say, or, or non-disclosure or withholding information. So, as you may know, multiple people reported uh, Blackmore Bond to action fraud. They all got this fob off response. Um, on, on this occasion, based on the information, it's not been possible to identify a line of inquiry which a law enforcement organisation in the UK, UK could pursue. Complete nonsense. And um, these are just a few of the very the many that uh, victims got back. All saying the same thing, no lines of inquiry. Nonsense. This, this is because the NFIB knew of this investigation into Capita Road Pension, which was initiated by the SFO in May 2017. None of McCreesh are under investigation as part of that because they got 600 grand for inducing people to invest in this scam. You know, and I think there was 120 million lost in that one. This one here, again, this is this is the the SFO investigation of LCNF. Surge Financial are part of that, are subject to that investigation. Their director was arrested, questioned and released pending further investigation. Now, Surge were paid over six million pounds for inducing people to invest in Blackmore Bond. So you've got two... The, the NFIB say there's no lines of inquiry. It just, it's just wrong. They're not, we're not saying that, no, oh, there's no evidence to convict. It's a line of inquiry. There are two blatant lines of inquiry here that would be ignored and buried. Um, you know, and you know, there's no way they, the action fraud or NFIB did not know about these when literally misleading investors as to there being no lines of inquiry. Um, City of London Police, they responded to um, a freedom of information request. Uh, whereby I and the Daily Telegraph also did one. Can you please provide uh, information regarding the amount of reports and when they occurred in respect to Blackmore Bond and any other Blackmore vehicle? Here you go. The, F the C uh, City of London Police uh, provided all that information as they should. I made the same request to the FCA this year and referred to this. The FCA refused to provide the information on the basis that it was vexatious. Um, you know, it, but the City of London Police provided it and every other regulator I know is happy to provide those, well, not always happy, but they will provide the information in respect to reports and complaints, et cetera, but not the FCA. So we still don't know how many other people reported Blackmore Bond beyond myself and uh, and the IFA in 2018. So after the late last fob off, I then submitted a report to action for all, right, let's see them try and fob me off. And I, I literally dumped all my evidence I had at the time to a City of London Police email address said, there you go, get on with that. Don't claim there's no lines of inquiry to see if they would fob me off. And that was in June 21. Then I get this response eventually, uh, that was in April 21. This is in June 21, where lo and behold, the city run the police confirmed that they have, everyone's agreed that they're gonna, um, that the insolvency service is going to investigate the matter. Um, so and this is all being agreed by the F FCA, SFO, um, and city of London police. Conveniently, the, the insolvency service has probably the most limited scope of all of them. And they don't have a mandate to investigate or explore what, what ball dropping went on in the FCA and in City of London Police. They were just focusing on the on, on the company. So, but it's interesting, and again, later on this will become more relevant. They do, I spoke to the insolvency service investigator and she told me that she had literally, in June 21, only just been given the instruction to investigate. And yet Kroll, the liquidators of uh, Blackmore Bond, had made re their report after three months in June 2020, over a year earlier, they had to make an initial report as their statutory obligation requires. And they raised serious concerns with the insolvency service as to Blackmore Bond and what they what they had discovered uh, upon going in. So why did the insolvency service take a year to open an investigation? So... Um, and this is me contacting the insolvency service investigator. I spent a lot of time on the phone with her and I, I shared with her the Blackmore Bond video, uh, the Blackmore Bond presentation I did um, for the TTF back in 2021. So plenty of evidence for, for them to digest. Now, <laughs> that's not too bad, 53 slides down. Right, so now August last year, 
Many of you will have seen the, the BBC Panorama programme, the billion pound saving scandal. Now, we spent nine months working on this and preparing it. And I think the, the producers and the directors and the team, they did an amazing job. And one of the things that it was so important to get across and they did it so well was that it was the targeting of non-sophisticated individuals. That was the, the, the focus. That's the, the, the clear and unequivocal breach of FISMA and FCA Cobbs, as I've said before. And they really got that message across. And it exposed everything the FCA was saying beforehand. Oh, there's nothing we can do. It's all beyond their perimeter authority and powers. So this really did force that into the picture. And the FCA then, all they've done since is seek to change the narrative again. So, um, and many, many of you will remember that the week, weekend after uh, Black the Panorama, Mark Stewart did a, an interview with the Sunday Times. I mean, complete non It was just a damage limitation exercise. Um, and, the, and there was all hell broke loose on the Sunday morning when the original story went out with the, the tagline, FCA, don't blame us for lost millions, blame the government. It, they, it, all hell broke loose. And within a few hours, it was changed. And the, But then the tagline wasn't changed to anything better for the FCA because it says... They quoted Stuart saying, there's no such thing as a risk-free investment, says the regulator. That's what Stuart actually said. And there's a significance to that. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. So, um, so yeah, and, and one thing Mr. Ratty said when he took over and he first addressed the Treasury Select Committee in his capacity as CEO, he bemoaned how labour and resource intensive after the event investigations are, right? But, well, then don't, don't allow the fraud to incur in the first place. Be proactive, investigate intelligence and reports that you have. And, and, it, and not only will it then be much more easy and, and efficient to deal with, but it also acts as a deterrent to future ones. If you don't do anything, it, it just encourages future, um, you know, future offending. So now one thing that, about Panorama that I want you to say, I didn't pull punches in Panorama. I, I made some serious allegations about the FCA that they, particularly that they, they dropped the ball in March 17. In August 2018, Bailey Stewart and the FCA realised they'd dropped the ball. And instead of picking it up, they dishonestly sought to bury the ball and the, bury the investors along with it. That's a punchy allegation, right? Now, and under rule of law, Bailey and the FCA were all given the right to reply. They could have said, that's not true. You have to take that out. They didn't. All they did instead was try and put forward a different narrative in the hope that people believe them over me. But the bottom line is they could have thought if what I was saying was was false, they had the right to force the BBC to withdraw that. They didn't. And Bailey himself refused to comment at all. So I'm accepting that as their acceptance that they knew what I was saying was truth and fact. And what did they do? They tried to introduce a different narrative that was entirely false. And I'm going to dissect it here now. So. Mr. Stewart in the Times interview and the FCA in the Panorama programme represented that they had shared intelligence with City London Police in 2017. And they did it so as to deny my allegations that they had failed to act on my, my reports and intelligence in 2017. But, and we now know, this was rather false and or misleading by way of omission of some rather key detail. Okay, so in December, you may now have seen the letter that um, Nick Arathi wrote to the Treasury Select Committee. It was published, I think, a couple of weeks ago, and it's, it's made a bit of a splash in, in, in the media, where he admits that, um, the F he says the FCA shared intelligence in relation to the Blackmore Bomb with London Police in 2017, although regrettably human error meant that the full suite of information was not sent across. Huge human error, and it has significant consequences, right? So both Stewart and um, the FCA and Mr. Rathi, you know, failed to share that, initially failed to share that material piece of information about the human error. So maybe the FCA, Rathi and Stewart weren't aware of that piece of glaring failure when they were making these representations. Um, well, they were, because in a letter to me in tw like 21st of December 2021, which is a year earlier than Rathi makes his admission, that like, I have all this stuff coming to me. They confirm that they opened an investigation with, with FISMA powers. So again, you know, contradictory what they'd originally been saying. Um, and it went to the unauthorized business department. And then they say, um, so in April, 2017, they opened an investigation. But subsequent to this, the FCA became aware of pre-existing investigation by another law enforcement agency, which included activity being undertaken by MEMA. So what did the FCA do? They've, by this time, they've got my reports and intelligence. They've got that, but they've now been contacted by 
a police force investigating this so there's some serious stuff going down here and the fca said in order to invent to avoid the risk of prejudice to that investigation the fca's investigation into mima was closed in july 17 and in another document the fca confirmed that they didn't bother telling anyone about the concerns and risks that Amima and Blackmore Bond posed. Uh, that's in another freedom of information request. So, you know, but they say it, to avoid the risk of prejudice, they, they they close their own investigation down. But in the same letter, they confirm the underlying details of this intelligence, which would have included your March 2017 communications, were, however, unfortunately not shared due to human error. They admit the human error a year earlier, but don't mention the human error in Panorama or in the interview afterwards. Rafi only admits it after I point out to the Treasury Select Committee and others that this letter existed and they this human error occurred. So far from you know sharing information, they compromise the City of London Police investigation. Because if you say to the City of London Police, yeah, we've heard something, but you don't share the smoking gun intelligence, then the police investigation is going to go, well, we haven't got any evidence to pursue an inquiry. So they compromise the police investigation. And, and if, as the evidence suggests, the city of London police didn't take it further, to what extent was that response was a, a result of the FCA failing to share the real key evidence with them? So it's uh, just just astonishing. Um, but these belated admissions to the human error um, and the FCA confirmation of the same to me is still not a full and honest representation of the facts and events within the FCA following my March 2017 reports. So. So in July 2020, I get this. This is a freedom of information response from the FCA in response to my, what did you do in response to my complaints? And in this one, they make an entirely different version of events. So in this one, they confirm, yes, they got my reports in uh, um, in March 2017 and an investigation was, in, was, uh, was, was undertaken. And this is the key. In May 17, the FCA formed the view that Blackmore was not carried on regulated activities without fca authorization because it fell within the exclusion absolute nonsense because we've already established what they were doing and what i reported was squarely within the perimeter they were marketing and, and uh, selling to non-sophisticated investors now it's in this is incredibly important because what this proves is that the fca did nothing the fca according to this shut it down they shut it down in may 2007 and did nothing because they made a judgment that not there was no regulated activity the judgment's incorrect and, the, and basically what, what's happened thereafter is mean all the false representations by the FCA to try and you know, claim that they did do something. This proves that they shut it down, did nothing, and had made an incorrect determination and ignored the fact that the, the FISMA and COBS was being breached. A very important little note here that's become very important given some uh, evidence from uh, that's just come in. They, they confirm here that from March 2017, NCM Fund Service, an, an FCA authorised firm, approved the content of Blackmore's financial promotions. There's a reason for that, because they, the promotions have to be approved by an FCA regulated and authorised company to make sure they are fair, clear and not misleading and satisfy. And that's a specific requirement of FCA COBS, that all communications to uh, retail customers must be fair, clear and not misleading and also be accurate. Right. So this company had to approve those documents and had to rubber stamp the authenticity and the accuracy of them so um where do we get here oh yeah so um you yeah, know mr raffi also writes in december 22 um to the, the treasury select committee um if we do not agree with the assertion that we ignored intelligence about a meme received in 2007 that's a lie because we've already seen the evidence that proves that they did nothing they buried it they literally made a determination in may 2017 wrongly there was no, no breach of FISMA or COBS, so they buried it, right? So, you know, that's a false representation. We've already seen that the sharing of information simply on the police is a complete red herring because they compromised the investigation by not sharing the the, uh, um, uh, the relevant information. But Mr. Rathley, to the Treasury Select Committee, then seeks to use this to justify, oh, no, we did take action in response to that intelligence received in 2017. He says to the Treasury Select Committee, in his letter, in March 2019, the FCA took steps which led to the removal of Amima's website. Following this, Amima's appointed representative status was terminated in September 2019. To be clear, he is using this to deny allegations they did nothing in response to my March 17 uh, reports. He's saying that this was a direct result of that. Whereas Amima didn't even become FCA authorised as an appointed rep until July 2018. So how can the removal of their approved status 
have been a result of the stuff that I sent to the SCA in March 2017, when in actual fact, they buried that and then they went and authorised the MEMA in 2018. The action in 2019 is therefore, it's dishonest to say that was a result of the intelligence I shared in March 17, because if it had been, they'd never have authorised them in the first place. Absolutely sickening that you know, Rathi would, it's bad enough they've been deceiving investors. Here he, he literally makes a false and misleading representation to the Treasury Select Committee. So, and let's, face, let's not forget, Mr. Rathi owns the register. So he will know that information exists and, uh, and he made a false representation in, in respect to it. The other thing in, in Panorama, the, the, they, they were adamant, and this is the defence that they used, uh, um, and Stuart had said this before, the SCA would not be able to act if an investor had ticked a box saying they were, they were sophisticated. False. Because in 2016, the FCA prohibited any firms from accepting self-certification by tick box by a consumer as to their sophistication. The FCA from 2016 had demanded that all firms must undertake due diligence and take steps to establish and validate that each and every investor was sophisticated. It was clear they weren't, and it was clear they were manipulating the sophistication and telling people to, sign, to tick that box, which Dane Gloucester had, had referred to and is a horrifying breach of, 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 of FISMA and an absolute attempt to circumvent FISMA. So the FCA relied on a process they themselves have prohibited to justify doing nothing. I mean, it's astonishing. Um, Rathi also says this, um, uh, you know, he, he also says the same when he um, writes to the, the uh, Treasury Select Committee um, in the December. And he confirms the loans or mini bonds with marketers as only being suitable for restricted, high net worth, sophisticated or self-sophisticated investors. But he relies again on the self-certified -certif sophisticated investors. The same certificate that was prohibited in 2016, the year Blackmore bond launched. So anyone self-certifying sophistication, you know, it was unacceptable for these firms to, to accept that. Um, but Mr. Raffi tries to use it as if that's some kind of, that absolves them of all responsibility when it doesn't. What that does, it puts it even further into the FCA's uh, uh, remit. Mark Stewart, the headline for the uh, uh, in the Sunday Times interview, there's no such thing as a risk-free investment, says the regulator. This was the own, another own goal by Stewart because he, he acknowledges there's no such thing as a risk-free investment. Okay, well, when I made my reports in March 2017, I'm reporting that these people are flogging a risk-free investment, right? So... Therefore, you knew that that had to be a scam or that had to be a fraud, and you still did nothing. And and they were and was it a fraud? Yes, it was because they were telling people that that these bonds that they're pushing are be, they're, they're telling pensioners they are guaranteed by one of the world's largest banks. Stewart knows that that that's nonsense. He know and he knows that this is representing a risk free investment. But I've worked for many of the world's largest banks. No bank in the world is ever going to offer that. So you don't need the benefit of hindsight to know that was a false representation and therefore fraud because it was made with intent to make financial gain. And Stewart knows that. And Stewart, obviously, with the MOU, had the obligation to report that to City of London Police and didn't. So I did a, another Freedom of Information request to the FCA and said, what does the FCA, what's the protocol for the FCA if they receive reports and intelligence about something that's beyond their perimeter authority powers? We signpost the provider, i.e. me or others, to the relevant appropriate agency or to make information available to the appropriate agency. Since 20, March 2017, in all the times I've reported stuff to the FCA, they never once signposted me to any other agency, right? So if it, so this further proves that they knew that this was all well within their perimeter authority powers because they didn't signpost me. You know, they accept, they just took it, they ran with it because they knew full well everything I was reporting was squarely within their perimeter. And this is this is from the horse's mouth. This is from Mark Stewart. So, you know, and it's, you know, we got the investigation. We know started in, in August 2018. We're still going in, all, in September 2019, 13 months later, you know, within two Mark Stewart emails. If it's not in your perimeter authority and powers, then you know that within an hour, right? So... Why are you spending 13 months investigating something that you later say was beyond your perimeter authority and powers? Complete nonsense. If you're lifting a thing to investigate to that extent, you know full well it is. And therefore, when you say afterwards it wasn't, then you're lying. So, um, and this just uh, overgo, just reviews some other bits and pieces um, where this is the obfuscation from Steward. Are we, in, we do not comment on operational managers. 
And again, this is the thing. Not once did they ever engage with me. In all these years, which we get, we, next, well, next month, March, this, it's going to be six years, and not once have the FCA ever engaged with me. Um, and again, here, never never points me to another authority, so knows full well that it's all within their, their perimeter and powers. Now we come on to this document. This is the letter that we featured in uh, Panorama. Okay, now this was this was in a DSAR response that I got, and this was in October 2021. And it's like, you see it here, it says, uh, sent by email to me, got my email address. And it's like, hang on, I've, I've never seen this before. I had made a complaint to the FCA in September 2019 that they'd failed to act upon my reports and intelligence. But this, when I opened this in my DSA response, this was October 21, two years later. But what this rep, what this means here, the highlight, it was the draft. So this is what, and this is October 2020. So this was the draft produced by the investigator that had spent 13 months investigating my complaint, okay? Reviewed all of the evidence, and I've got 2,000 internal FCA documents, most of them heavily redacted, that show they were doing a massive investigation of various things. For example, there's, there's one document where the title is Blackmore Bond Associated Companies. The rest of it's redacted, but the bloody document runs for five pages. So let's not kid ourselves in terms of what the FCA or oh, maybe they didn't have everything available. So, and obviously this is the this is the letter that had the smoking gun comment across. The, like, so this is the guy that's investigating for thirteen months, and he concludes. I consider, however, I can see there was a missed opportunity to reconsider and act on the separate intelligence you provided. That was in respect to two thousand seven. It says again. He says they missed the opportunity again in August two thousand eighteen. But as you can see, it's crossed out, right? So they clearly, you know, this guy's. Uh, uh, produced it and someone's crossed it out now what this guy spent 13 months investigating it now the fca um uh but their defense when when asked by panorama they claimed oh no the, the findings were changed because new evidence came to light and mr rathy writes the same to siobhan mcdonough of the treasury select committee in that letter she said uh, Ms. Ms. McDonald stated that she understood the FCA confirmed in writing that had missed an opportunity to act in relation to, uh, to Blackmore bonds. Um, so Rathi then says, as noted in the BBC Panorama program, the FCA has explained that the discrepancy between the draft response to the complaint mentioned in the DSAR and the final response was due to new evidence coming to light. What? What new evidence? What could possibly have come to light after October 2020, right? After, th you know, three years after my reports and two and a bit years after the FCA started an investigation. What, and this guy investigated this for 13 months, what new evidence could have come to light that changes that conclusion that we didn't drop the ball? You go, how do you go from com confirmation and conclusion that we did drop the ball big time to no, we didn't drop the ball? What possible evidence could have come to light to change that conclusion? I mean, I've asked the FCA, they refuse to correspond. Somebody tell me, please, because if you can, and I, I'd really like to see the Treasury Select Committee ask that question, because I think it's a valid question. Um, yeah, so complete nonsense here. You know, this guy concluded this after 13 months. And the other thing that, that really does destroy Mr. Rathy's argument, the person who produced that original complaint response after 13 months investigation is hauled off of it after producing that, replaced by somebody else, entirely who then spends a year investigating and produces a different response nonsense why did you why did you change the guy who'd been investigating it for 13 months because you wanted a different outcome that one didn't sit well with you that one confirmed that the fca dropped the ball and the hierarchy did not want that going out simple as simple as that why else take the guy off the complaint he's been investigating it for 13 months and he didn't leave the fca because he's still there i, I know that for fact I'll, I'll check that so let's move on to the the fca apm now yeah, this is the 12th of October, um, and what I'm going to go through now is a series of freedom of information requests that I sent to the FCA in the days following this annual public meeting that was held on 12th of October 2022. On each one of these, I copied the Treasury Select Committee and Andy as well, uh, the Transparency Task Force. Um, let me just go back because... Um, now, the Freedom of Information Act exists for one reason and one reason only. And that is so that we, the consumers or the media or, or, or government, can hold public bodies to account for everything they say and everything they do, right? So they say something, you have the right to say, oh, you said this, but 
you know, and challenge it or ask for information in respect to it. So, um, and I, I sent six freedom of information requests to the FCA, each one of them specific to a representation that Mark Stewart had made at the APM specific to Blackmore Bond. He made these representations with Mr. Rathy present. So presumably Mr. Rathy was agreeable to those and approved of those representations. He made no effort at any time to correct Mr. Stewart. And several of the, and it was quite clear that some of the responses were a bit canned or pre-prepared. So the first one. So this is what, um, this was the disturbing one. This is the, and I, as you can see here, I include the actual quote from the transcript here, right? So Mark Stewart opens with just a little background. Blackmore bonds were offered to consumers um, to raise money to develop properties and pay a return to these bond terms. Those bonds represented unsecured loans from consumers to a company, right? He was saying there and there that Blackmore bond was not an investment, but instead people loaned money. They, these were literally loan, unsecured loans from the customer. Astonishing. And the first time, in October 22, the first time the FCA had come up with this, this line of defense. Now, you can almost see that, you know, Panorama's dropped the, 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 the pebbles in the pond. Oh, how are we going to? I know. Let's just pretend they weren't investments at all. And therefore, we'll try and boost them and kick them out of our perimeter altogether. So, you know, it's astonishing that he would make that representation. So, and ironically, it appeared that that line was pre-planned, but then later in the same transcript, he starts referring to black bonds, this kind of investments or people that invested in Blackmore bonds or 47 million pounds was invested. Well, it was either an investment mark or it was a loan. You know, it's, it didn't say loaned, it was an investment. And the, and he made the same in same uh, representations in the in the Sunday Times uh, damage li limitation articles, and he was also claiming that the FCA didn't have the powers. It does have the powers. He just chose not to use them on this 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 occasion. Um, so I quote um, uh, Stewart again, um, where he said, "While the FCA does everything in its powers to protect consumers and help them make informed decisions, there's no absolute safety net, and the regulator cannot insulate, protect, or immunize customers." From risky consequences um, of every investment decision, and in the and he says, Stewart said the FCA had no power to stop people investing in Blackmore, not loans, investing. So, um, and this is what I and the, say the IFA were, were reporting. Again, here's here's an example of a Facebook loan that the IFA um, sent into Mark Stewart himself in March 2018. Where does it say? Oh, uh, it's a loan. Invest your savings, right? Income certainty, bonds, right? It's not a loan, it was an investment. So, and that's what it's clearly investigating. But, but and at the bottom, I asked him for the FCA to provide information to explain why Mr. Stewart yesterday sought to reclassify Blackmore Bond as unsecured lending, as opposed to an, an investment. And he did so for the benefit of the public and media uh, with an apparent intent to mislead the public media and the victims and cre create desired sound bites. And I also asked, like, can the FCA explain why Mr. Stewart, with the apparent approval of Nick Rathy, who was present at the meeting, made no attempt to, to correct uh, Stewart on this? Um, and it's an absolute false and misleading narrative. And I'm just going to refer you. This is, you know, and again, the FCA clearly don't know the amount of evidence I've got. This is the 49 page um, uh, 2018 information memoranda that was sent out to, uh, to potential investors. If you look at the top right here in the search box, I put the word invest. It's found on 42 pages of the 49 page document, right? So, you know, it's an invest, it, it, that word appears, right? The word investor found on 32 pages within the information memoranda. The word investment found on 36 pages of the investment memoranda, right? This is an example page from there, right? Investment highlights. Look how many invest, investments, investors, right? It's an investment, right? So, and if you, I did this, this is the search for the word loan, right? As, as claimed by the FCA, it appears once. And the only time it appears is in this paragraph here uh, and where it's a, and it's in reference to secured loans from third party lenders or banks. It's not got nothing to do with investors. The word loan appears once in a 49 page document. And yet the FCA would have you believe that these were unsecured loans by these people, not investments. It was an investment, end of story, period. So um, it, 
this it's clearly an attempt to retrospectively reclassify and to be very clear it does not matter what the fca reclassifies them as now all that matters is what these retail investors were told they were in the marketing material on which their de decision to invest was based they were clearly marketed as an investment but let's not forget the fca has form for this type of retrospective reclassification and to the detriment of victims they are currently being sued by the appg business banking for doing the same to victims of irhp fraud by banks right it's how the hell can they sit there at that apm and say these were secured loans not investments are just astonishing um right next foi request um and again it quotes um it quotes mr stewart as saying um it does everything its powers for the safety net yada 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 um and you know this is in that uh, um times uh interview he said consumers have been marketed a risk-free investment i mean again like, how many ways do you want to con contradict yourself and tie yourself in knots i i'm trying to skim through these because i'm conscious of the time um so having made the statements of the sunday times quite correctly because there can be so, no such thing as a guaranteed investment you know here Mark Stewart, and this is where we get into some nitty gritty here. He says part of the proposition to consumers was involved something called a capital protection scheme. It was actually called the capital guarantee scheme. Again, but not really a word he wants to use, guarantee, because obviously he's confirmed there's no such thing as a guaranteed or risk-free investment. So he highlights that the capital protection scheme offered amounts of up to £75,000 for losses arising from the investment. Investment, not secured loan or unsecured loan, investment. The insurer is a legitimate insurer, right? We understand that claims have been made, uh, but no, there has not been a, a payment and the liquidator, uh, an insurer, um, there's more to pay out, okay? So, but and he says again here, in addition to the insurer, the way in which legislation operates backward bonds, unregulated firm, able to issue mini bonds without being regulated by the FCA, that's outside of perimeter. Garbage, because what he fails to mention is that not one, not two, but three FCA authorised and regulated insurance brokers were responsible for arranging this insurance, right? Now that's within their perimeter. And one of the overriding factors that a, a, an insurance professor told me is that an insurance broker has to make sure that the product is appropriate, really. Okay. It's appropriate, yeah? So you can't get the insurance from the EU or the UK for obvious reasons, because it's just complete garbage so you get it from a firm in costa rica and i understand the commissions that the brokers received were substantial but they clearly wasn't appropriate and the proof is in the pudding you don't need the hindsight this was never going to pay out because it had, it had two exemptions in there it said it wouldn't pay out in the event of fraud by directors or that if the portfolio wasn't properly diversified in those two things you have pretty much every reason why an investment of this type collapses for one or both and in this case you had both you had fraud by the by the firm and directors and it wasn't diversified because it was all in property. So again, Mark Stewart tying himself in knots. So I quite reasonably asked, you know, why Mr. Stewart is now referring to and relying upon representations as this capital guarantee scheme, which is an investment insurance product that was used to dupe consumers into believing this was a risk-free investment and appeared to make this a risk-free investment, having earlier told us sometimes there could be no such thing. Can the FCA explain why these investment products that seek to guarantee investments or these insurance products and make them risk-free have not been prohibited by the FCA, given that A, there can be no such thing as investment insurance, and B, they are used to create the illusion of risk-free investments. And C, we now have evidence of numerous such investment insurance products all having refused to pay out for one reason or another, and that is clearly an issue the FCA is aware of, because it's been going on for over a decade. I thought Blackmore Bond was unique. Oh, I mean, insurance investment, whoever... Who would have ever thought of it? After Panorama, we've got loads of people coming forward with, with similar investments that had, had the similar guarantee. And funnily enough, none of them paid out. So, um, and I referenced, asked them for information. Dane Gloucester referred to the use of halos to dupe investors. All of this was part of the halo process that uh, the, these, these frauds were using. So, Stewart's made a, a, a statement. I've asked for information to explain why his statement at the APM contradicted um, previous representations he's made and for information as to what the FCA knew about these investment products. The FCA refused to provide the information claiming this was vexatious. So, you know, you know, the, whereas all I'm trying to do is hold them to account for what they've said and why, and highlight the con contradictions and ask the FCA to give me the information to explain why there's all these contradictions. So not vexatious is actually and absolutely literally what the FOA is, is, is for.
Now, this is the this is a, the shocker. As I said before, Mark Stewart called this insurer, said this insurer is a legitimate insurer. Oh, really? So the Costa Rican, after the panorama, I got given a document uh, by uh, somebody in who's been investigating insurance scams, particularly by these reinsurers and everything else. Um, and this document contains disturbing references to somebody called Robert Harrison. Now, Robert Harrison is the ION underwriter who's involved in the underwriting of the Blackmore Bond Capital Guarantee Scheme. He's named on all the correspondence and everything else, right? So, but, and I, I sent the FCA the, this dubious reinsurance document that this person put together, and it's a brilliant document. It's very succinct to the point, unlike me, um, and summarizes all these frauds and everything and has all these links in here. Harrison, right, director of underwriting at ION, was a former owner of an insurance firm by the name of Northern and Western Insurance Company. And I refer them to this article in the, from the Daily, uh, uh, Daily Mirror um, and this one from The Guardian. So it features the collapse of many other UK property investments, including the caps of Key Homes Group in 2014, long before Blackmore Bond. And there's no way this wasn't on the FCA's radar. Right. So investors in Key Homes Group Limited were also duped by this guarantee of uh, investment. And it was by Harrison's company. So as you can see here, investors in a property scheme thought they were in safe hands because they were being advised by a law firm and protected by an insurance policy. But 882 people were stung for almost 53 million when it collapsed. And the insurance company that supposedly protected the deposits also collapsed and failed to honor the policies. Robert Harrison's company. And it turned out that they never had more than 78,000 in capital when they were selling insurance for this 53 million investment now this isn't the only um uh issue that he's been involved in he's been banned from the insurance business in the u.s for and quote fraudulent and dishonest practices and having wholly mis misappropriated premiums and there is a whole uh, litany of other cases uh, which he's been involved in which is included in that document and Stewart called him a legitimate insurer um but it gets worse so and there's a great article here about Harrison and his, his checker pass and reveals even more. Um, however, they don't only employ Harrison. They've got another guy, David William King. He's their senior compliance officer at ION in Costa Rica. Um, and his bio reads, responsible for admin, duty and compliance issues, yada, yada. 40 years insurance and reinsurance experience in the London and international markets. Wow, underwriting management, all this, all this palaver. However, um, we'll come back. So... <laughs> it's the same David William King who's the subject of an FSA final notice dated 4th of June 2007 right and this the, you have to read this notice I, I recommend anyone click that link in afterwards and read the bloody notice right he um this is this is what the FSA was saying about it Mr King's conduct poses a serious risk to consumers in the financial system in general his conduct was below the standards of competence and capability and he says that here there was no cover in place at all. The insurer didn't have liquid assets. Mr. King's reputation below the level required of partic participant in the insurance industry has failed to meet the standards. Um, he's not a fit and proper person. I mean, but according to Mark Stewart, the APM, legitimate insurer, right? This, this is a firm of cowboys, right? And these people with a history of insurance fraud and misappropriation insurance premiums. And yet Stewart at the APM refers to him as a legitimate insurer. Absolute shocking. Either Stewart was unaware of any of this, which how can he be unaware of any? One of the one of the notices is an FCA final notice, or he lied. In, in you know, in another and they, just to try and like establish the credibility of this thing, and again to try and highlight the fact they haven't dropped the ball. So, in respect to that, as you can see here, I make a series of requests for information from the FCA to explain why Mr. Stewart would refer to this firm as an legitimate insurer, given all that information and, and evidence, this isn't me making up, this is evidence to prove that this company was far from a legitimate insurer. So freedom of information for that purpose, hold them accountable for things they say. Mr. Stewart said they're a legitimate insurer. I provide evidence to prove any, they're anything but, and ask the FCA for information to explain why. They dubbed this, they refused to provide information claiming this was vexatious as well. So these complaints are all in train and, uh, you know, are, are, are being challenged uh, significantly. So, um, but maybe uh, Mr. Griffith, HMT and Treasury Select Committee would like to 
ask these questions of the FCA themselves and try and get to the bottom of this because that's all I was trying to do. They made representations. I had evidence to prove that, that there was that was wrong, incorrect or false. I provided the evidence to support it and asked them for information to explain why the, the contradiction is there and they've refused to provide it. So, uh, and you know, I could go on for ages. So um, as you say, I included, this, this is just to show that there was an attachment of that dubious insurer's document that went in with that FOI request. So they had all the evidence and tried to, they've tried to bury it. So um, this one really sticks in my craw. Uh, this is, this is um, Stuart says, he tries to say around 47 million was invested in Blackmore. Of that 2,200 people, uh, we received about 36 complaints. Uh, 36, but not a high amount. I mean, he's literally using the relatively no number of complaints made to the FCA as a reason to imply that these people didn't care, right? They, they didn't care about this investment. They couldn't be bothered to complain. Well, why would they complain? You've done everything you've done in the press in the, in the preceding years was to tell people it wasn't your it wasn't your perimeter. It was nothing to do with you. And the 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 early investors that did complain received a complete fob off response, whereby they said that they were deferring. Um, um, they were deferring investigation of the complaint because there was ongoing regulatory action. And this was being shared by the investors that had made these early complaints with all the other investors on significant groups and everything else. So why would anyone else complain when they know that investors are being told we're deferring your complaint indefinitely? And these people have had deferrals now every month for two years. They're just, they're just kicking it into long grass. And uh, you know, so who's going to complain when they're aware that that's the response you're going to get. You're going to wait until you, know, you hear from others what's going on. So, but he tries to use that as a reason to imply that these people didn't care or these people weren't affected enough to care. Couldn't be, couldn't be more further from the truth. And it's a shocking, disingenuous um, act by by Stewart. It probably, and that I don't know why that annoys me more than most of the other stuff, but it does. Um, and it just shows that his complete lack of understanding and empathy of the impact. So I, I go in here to, you know, again, establish why, you know, people didn't complain because they were telling everyone to MPs and it, nothing uh, within their control. Um, so I, again, I asked for information why Mr. Short used, used a low number of complaints to apply a lack of significance, a lack of impact and disinterest by victims when the FCA has essentially told the world, the media and everyone that it was nothing to do with the FCA, so don't bother to complain to us. Um, so, and... I don't know. Yeah, so this is this is reference to the fob off responses that uh, various victims were were getting, um, and and I actually include the two fob off responses down the bottom there. They're attached to the email to show, you know, well, what do you expect, and can you explain why you would use do such a thing to these investors and downplay their their damages? Um, right. So this one here, I'm trying to remember what one, <laughs> what one this is now. So again, this is this is another uh, freedom of information request. Um, and again, I outline what Mark Stewart said. Okay, uh, you know what his representation was. There it is. Now this is really important. The information is uh, they Mark Stewart confirms that they've been investigating to make sure that the information that's been provided to consumers in those marketing materials uh, was accurate, was clear, and was not misleading. Now he uses those words: fair, clear, and accurate, clear, and not misleading, because. That's an obligation under COPS, right? FCA COPS. All these communications have to be fair, clear, and not misleading. And these were approved by NCM fund services, right? The opening page of the thing, FCA fund, FCA authorized firm. They're using this firm to create the halo. But that firm has an obligation to confirm that everything within that material, if they're approving it, they are essentially saying they are saying that everything within that document is, is accurate, um, fair, clear, and not misleading. Now he says on 12th of October. Our work in relation to this is virtually complete um, at this stage. It does look as though those financial promotions were largely accurate in what they set out and contain very, very relevant risk warnings for consumers. Really, he's emphatic, appropriate, and contain very relevant risk warnings for consumers. However, I attached the Blackmore Bond uh, Series 4 brochure again, um, and this is the one that he refers to. Um, and on the various pages throughout, and I'm going to skim these because again, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, again, it's all it's all referred to as an investment, uh, yada yada yada. Um, and there are risk warnings here, but 
every time there's a risk warning, it's overridden by the frequent representations made within the document as to the investment being secured against the assets first, and then also guaranteed by insurance, right? Particularly, but not exclusively, the following content. So how secure is it? Oh, here we go. First one, page nine, insured by capital uh, protection scheme. How secure is it? Multi-layered security risk, capital protection, um, page 13. I mean, it goes on and on and on, right? The, you know, the, it outlines risk, but everywhere it does, it's, it's, it, there's an inclusion of something that confirms there is no risk, okay? So um, again, the bonds will be secured uh, to, to seek to protect bondholders in, <laughs> in the event of a, a default, they put in place security protection, right? In the case of any shortfall default in repaying bondholders, capital protection scheme is in place. So, and it goes on throughout the entire document, the full investment value of the bonds will be secured, right? I mean, it, it just, it's relentless throughout, okay? I mean, I, and he's saying that there was adequate risk warnings. I mean, they did have warnings of risk, but wherever they included it, they said in the event of that risk happening, we've got a capital guarantee protection scheme. So, you know, they essentially mitigated any risk. So they were, it's irrelevant. You can't say that there is a risk and, and say that's a risk warning when it's accompanied by multiple uh, statements and representations that is all guaranteed. Absolute nonsense. And if, so Stuart, you know, he has to know that that is not appropriate. So had he looked at this document or was he just lying when he said there were very adequate and appropriate risk warnings? Because there clearly weren't. And I don't know any professional who's looked at this who said there are, they were adequate. Absolutely astonishing. So, um, and again, I say it just goes on and on and on. So I asked, again, made re uh, requests for information to explain why Stuart would say that there was adequate risk warnings when clearly there wasn't. You know, this was as false or misleading as you can possibly get. So, um, <clears throat> but other false and or misleading representations, right? So here I include several really important claims that are made by Blackmore Bond in the, in the in the document right now this one here page 20 the investment brochure claims that 16 projects have been completed by Blackmore Bond between 2016 and 2018 generating total completed sales of 28 uh 28 million 146 thousand and a profit of 20 percent per development impressive right so I asked the FCA um, are any of the claims made by this Blackmore Bond investment broker as to completed Blackmore Bond or Blackmore Group projects and their values and returns correct? And so I ask questions to, okay, you said these are accurate. Okay, please provide the information to prove that these things are accurate. Well, not surprisingly, it was labelled vexatious, but there's a reason. Right? This, this, this page here is what purports that establishes a track record. If you read that, you go, wow, these guys are good, right? 28 million pro, uh, in sales, 20% profit. Who wouldn't invest in that? It took me less than five hours to determine that every one of them investments had nothing to do with Blackmore Bond. Like literally nothing, right? So how on earth is that? And the FCA, Mark Stewart said that they've reviewed, investigated this thoroughly and they said the whole document is largely accurate. Whereas this is entirely false. And it was approved by NCM Fund Services. So what is Stewart? doing trying to absolve ncm fund services of of any responsibility or failure this could not be more misleading more false and yet was signed off by ncm and stewards trying to absolve them of blame well ncm is one of as i've mentioned before there's three fca regulated insurance brokers involved but the total number of fca authorized firms involved in backmore and don't forget this is something that from the outset they said was all beyond their perimeter authority and powers there's seven Seven FCA authorized firms involved in Blackmore Bond to one extent or other. So is Mark Stewart, how you can claim that's accurate and not, and you know, it's fair, clear and not misleading when it's entirely false is beyond me. And it begs, are you, are, is Stewart and the FCA seeking to absolve all these FCA regulated firms of any responsibility? So they can say, see, you know, if we had looked at it in 2017, there was nothing to see here. They hadn't done anything wrong. But, you know, that to me is the only explanation for this. You know, because it's the only way they can make that fit. You know, they, they, they're falsifying and changing the narrative again to make it fit with that, those statements they've made previously. This was false. It was a false representation with intent to make financial gain. And it's in this bloody document. And it was signed off by an FCA authorised firm. And yet, Stewart says this was this was accurate. Complete nonsense. But what's interesting, um, I'll, I'll co cover this. This is the, um, the FISMA specific stuff. Mentions NCM, um, you know, 
that they've approved the financial promotion. And again, that makes it squarely within the uh, thing. And don't forget the earlier FOIs, FOI, uh, Freedom of Information Response in July 2020, confirmed that NCM was responsible from March 2017 for uh, approving these regulations. So again, squarely within uh, FCA uh, remit from the start, breach of FISMA and COBS, and the FCA dropped the ball by wrongly claiming there was no breach of FISMA or COBS and no regulated activity taking place when it was absolutely false. There was, and this proves it. So, um, so again, it, it points out it's restricted to certain categories of super investors. The FCA are already aware of that. Um, but we've already provided evidence, so they were being coached to self-certify. And um, again, I make requests for information to explain all of these contradictions, you know, to, you know between what Stuart said and the contemporary record and, and evidence. Now, that again, the purpose of the Freedom of Information Act. The FCA have said, we're not providing that information because that's vexatious. No, Mark Stewart lied. I provided the evidence to prove he lied and asked the FCA for information to explain why there was a difference. If he hadn't, I'd fine. But tell, give me the information to prove or explain why there's that contradiction between what he said in the, on the documentary record. That's not vexatious. That is doing what the Freedom of Information Act is there for. That's to holding them to account for what they've said or what they've done. Um, and throughout the document, the FCA halo appears, page four, page 15, page 26. There's repeated reference to FCA authorised firms and people. And, and again, 30, 31, 32, right? So, um, and attached to it, again, there was the bond document that uh, I uh, uh, attached. Now, this is, so it, largely accurate nonsense. What, it was completely dishonest and false what was in there. So they re refused to provide any information, right? Now, having refused to provide any information or even respond to my freedom of information request, they've made these, Stuart said, our work is virtually complete and these documents were largely accurate. That was in Oct October 12th. However, in late November, Mark Stewart writes a letter personally to Rosie Cooper MP, who's had a constituent write to her and she's asked the FCA. And in it, Mark Stewart completely backtracks from a conclusion six weeks earlier. He says, we are closely examining the adequacy of the financial promotions issued by Blackmore and aspects of the sales process. Our work is ongoing and we will take appropriate action if we identify breaches of the rules. Hang on, Mark. Six weeks earlier, you said that was virtually complete and it was all largely accurate, nothing to see here, so we're done. But I highlight that that was false. And then six weeks later, you don't respond to me, but you are now changing the narrative when you, when you communicate with MPs. You are literally falsifying the narrative and making it up as you go along. But it wasn't just, um, it wasn't just Stuart. This quote here, Rathie says exactly the same in December to the Treasury Select Committee. So two months after the FCA have said, oh, all com virtually complete, all largely accurate, he backtracks from it as well. So again, just making the narrative up uh, as they go along. So, but and if my response was vexatious, then why have you changed the narrative, Mark and, the, and Mr. Rathie? Why have you changed the narrative if what I've said in my Freedom of Information Act is vexatious? It clearly was, it was on the money because you changed the narrative. So, here we have the FCA making false and or misleading representations, and so have City of London Police, Action Fraud, and the NFOB doing likewise, suppressing and concealing evidence of fraud by Blackmore Bond and directors. As mentioned earlier, after I make the report to Action Fraud and basically force City of London Police into a corner by giving them the evidence and not enabling this fob off no lines of inquiry, they confirm that the various stakeholders have all decided they're going to have the insolvency service investigate. So um, and in consultation with the, it's determined the insolvency service will undertake the initial investigation if appropriate. So, having done that, I contacted the insolvency service, I gave them a load of information and everything else. However, since the Panorama broadcast, the FCA steward and Nicky Arathi have all stated that the insolvency service had investigated Blackmore Bond and its directors. And this is the actual reference from Mr. Rathi's letter to the Treasury Select Committee. The insolvency service has now examined the failure of Blackmore and completed its inquiries into the firm and conduct of the directors. The insolvency service has confirmed that he's not proposing to take any action. However, he didn't just say that in the letter. When he appeared before the Treasury Select Committee, Mr. Rathie interrupted Richard Lloyd, who was making the point, so, so that Mr. Rathie could make uh, the point that the insolvency service investigated and concluded not to take any action. He was now appointed to the wording. He was very careful with his words. His statement implies that the insolvency service must therefore have found no evidence of any wrongdoing or fraud or that Blackmore Bond was not part of the Ponzi scheme. However, he, he's careful not to say that. Why? Because he knows full well that would be a false representation. And if he does not know it, 
would be a false representation, then he is confirming gross misconduct and failures by the FCA and the insolvency service in terms of properly investigating, right? So, you know, because he knows full well it's a fraud and it was part of the Ponzi scheme because I basically shared the information with the insolvency service and the FCA to prove it. So how can, he doesn't say that they found no evidence of wrongdoing. He says they concluded not to take any action. He's inferring that they, they found no evidence of wrongdoing. But I asked the Treasury Select Committee and um, Mr. Griffiths, ask, perhaps ask um, Mr. Athey, are you saying, therefore, that the insolvency service and the FCA found no evidence of uh, fraud, wrongdoing, or that the uh, Blackmore bomb was part of the Ponzi scheme? Ask that question and see if his answer is consistent with what he tried to imply in that wording. So... And here's how we know that the FCA, City of London Police are, and the Insolvency Service are all well aware that Blackmore Bond involved fraud and was part of the Ponzi scheme. So, liquidators Crowell were bound to provide a report to the Insolvency Service within three months of their employment and included the following concerns. During our preliminary investigations, we have identified a significant number of matters related to the company and the wider group that require investigation. That was in June 2020. But we know that the Insolvency Service didn't lift a finger until June 2021 and only then after action fraud. However, another source has provided me with this statement from the, the, the joint liquidators also wrote, the joint administrators contacted the FCA shortly following their appointment in April 2020 and provided them with details of what they and their legal advisors consider to be regulatory failings of various parties involved in the company's business, together with information in their possession which we believe to be relevant. The joint liquidators have followed this up with the FCA on several occasions the joint legal data do not have visibility in the progress of any work being undertaken by the FCA in regulation to the company. The, the FCA is ring fencing it and not responding to these most serious concerns raised by the liquidators. So, again, the FCA is well aware of the full extent of what's gone on here. And uh, uh, so and I'm going to here is a real key. You, you might recall, John, uh, the opening of the panorama. You saw John Robbins, uh, former military veteran, served with distinction. Um, and he comments and arrives at uh, one of the director's houses and looks at the great house and everything else. Well, would it surprise you to know that John didn't actually invest in Blackmore Bond? He invested in something called Blackmore Estates. And John, after a, a presentation I did uh, for Transparency Task Force, John got in touch and so did another uh, investor. And both of them had invested in something called Blackmore Estates. This was a, this was a previous Nunn and McCreesh investment vehicle and they had told them yeah yeah it's performed brilliantly with you know your your investment has made five grand interest however rather than return them how about invest in this brand new and even better vehicle called blackmore bonds so and i was alarm bells were ringing and i asked both did they return the your principal that you invest in blackmore states and this interest they claimed that had been made to you first before you invested no they basically sold them on Blackmore Bond and said, don't worry, we'll just transfer your maturing investment and all the profits into Blackmore Bond. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a flag for me. So I helped them both. I drafted emails to send to liquidators and asked um, the uh, Kroll, uh, can you confirm that an investment was made on each of their behalf um, for that amount on the dates in question they were told? Kroll came back and confirmed, yes, we can confirm that company records show that an investment was made um, on each of their behalves on the date for that amount. So, um, which is fine, which is great. So then I crafted a, a follow-up for the investors um, who and asked them, can you please provide information to, to show the transfer or credit of cash or collateral to Blackmore Bond and their bank accounts in my name for that amount on or around those dates? Um, yeah, the Kroll had to confirm that, you know, there was no transfer of cash or collateral from Blackmore States to Blackmore Bond on or around those dates for those amounts. Um, Ponzi scheme. That is a Ponzi scheme. They have told. So if you if you're aware of made off all these other Ponzi schemes, there's a legitimate front of a business. So you, and you have two sets of company records. So the company records were clearly determining, yes, an investment had been made because they had to keep track of it. However, the bank accounts were showing that no transfer of cash was made. And Kroll have confirmed that there were a total of 20 such Ponzi transfers from Blackmore Estates into Blackmore Bond. Right, And this doesn't include any other but none of McCreese vehicles or any other vehicles from any of their cronies that are operating similar scams. Right? To be very clear, 
Blackmore Bond was part of a Ponzi scheme. That's a criminal enterprise. That's fraud, right? And the insolvency service knew it, the FCA knew it, and they're all trying to absolve the directors and the, uh, the company uh, of fraud and criminality. And Mr. Rathi, as I said, this is why he was so careful with his words. The insolvency service investigated, but they have concluded not to take any action. He absolutely avoids saying they found no evidence of wrongdoing. So, I mean, is it dishonest by Mr. Rathi and the FCA or disingenuous? Either way, it was misleading and he implied something. And I would dearly like people to challenge the Treasury Select Committee and MPs to challenge him on that and challenge any of this evidence I've got here. Because again, I'm not saying this without evidence. I've got the evidence to back it up. And also, Kroll also confirmed to me that they shared the same concerns that I had that this was a part of the Ponzi scheme. And these are the guys that have had access to the records. So they are fully aware and they've raised these concerns before. So, and I'm nearly, I'm nearly at the end, Andy, it won't be long, right? So, so let's just recap where we are, right? The, and since Blackmore Bond, since Panorama, I've been deluged with information and everything else. And, and I, I do try and respond to everybody, but I, I literally am one, one bloke doing it in my spare time, you know, um, albeit I'm getting some great help from the victims themselves who do themselves a disservice because they, they don't, they're not aware of how good they've been and how diligent they've been and how effective they've been. It will all, it will all pan out. So we already know that 46 million was invested in, in Blackmore Bond, right? We know that just under 7 million was paid to Surge for inducing investors into the fraud. We know that 2 million was paid to Aspinall Chase, the Gibraltar-based company owned by Nana McCreesh. We also know that 1 million was paid to the Blackmore Bond parent company for the services rendered by Nana McCreesh. What those services, who knows? So we therefore know that approximately 36 million was available for the investment purpose. So, um, right, so this is a spreadsheet that I've put together that collates different pieces of information. On the left, these are the various assets that um, Blackmore Bond owned at the time of its collapse in April 2020. And if you can see here in the third column, these are the current site values that Blackmore Bond had assigned to these various assets. And you can see down here, 22.8 million. Okay, 36 million in, 22.8, okay. You know, where's the other 13? But maybe there's construction costs or other costs that haven't yet been realized or, yeah. However, I'll refer you to this bottom right corner. <laughs> the total amount of secured lending from, from, bot, from credit institutions and lenders, 18.2 million, all secured against these assets, right? And these are the named Close Brothers assets, Nextius, Amicus, all like sort of bridging, like, well, not the best quality lenders, right? So 18.2 million secured lending, all secured against the same assets. Well, hang on. So you take away that lending, that leaves 4.6 million. Okay, where's 36 million available after all these obscene costs were paid? There's 4.6 million left after the secured lenders. Are, where's the rest of it gone? Where's the other 31.4 million gone? And I highlight these ones here in red because there's evidence to suggest that these, as you can see, these are significant developments. It doesn't appear that there was any security charge in favor of the investors, of the bondholders, just the lenders. So in fact, this gap between the, the secured lending and the asset value, the equity, so to speak, is actually probably far less than 4.6 million. But let's just go for the moment with 4.6 million, all right? Where'd the rest of the 31.4 million go? Well, my, following of threads led me to this this is the i don't know if you're aware of it but this is the, basically the database for uh investigative journalists and it's the this contains all the panama papers and uh uh all these offshore leaks that have made the pre headlines this stuff revealed david cameron's offshore interest and all these other personal well in there there's this there's this company bg holdings finance limited registered in the british virgin islands so this is in the panama papers who are the beneficial owners of this offshore vehicle in British Virgin Islands. Philip Nunn, Patrick McCreesh. Nunn and McCreesh, the beneficial owners of this offshore vehicle in BVI. So, and I have asked the insolvency service and the liquidators if, if they're aware of any other offshore vehicles other than the Isle of Man or Gibraltar entities that we featured in Panorama. And the answer is no. So, and this BG Holdings Finance is connected to another firm and I'm still following that lead because this other firm has got 36 other connections this Corinthian trust whole there's a whole can of worms here so my question is how much of that 31 missing 31 million 
And let's not forget, if there's 31 million missing, how can the insolvency service say there's no evidence of fraud or criminality here? How much of it ended up in BVI in this in this offshore vehicle belonging to Nana McCreesh? Simple question. It's very it's entirely valid. So, but in literally in the last few couple of weeks, we've now got evidence to show that the two million that was paid to Aspinall Chase in Gibraltar, the the Nana McCreesh uh, Gibraltar-based business that they owned was in fact used to pay 20% commissions to European-based firms and introducers who were introducing uh, uh, investors to, to Blackmore Bond. The evidence shows that these firms were generating falsified certification of sophistication of foreign investors and expat investors and producing QROPs like Qualified Recognised Overseas Pension Scheme applications that were then sent to pension trustees in the UK for release of pension money overseas. Once the pension money was out of the UK, it was then used to purchase life assurance bonds that were then used to invest in Blackmore and other scams. I mean, it's just a whole carousel of, of, of fraud and, and, and scams. We now have a dossier of the numerous firms and the various scams involved and a very good view of the whole picture. It is impossible that the FCA, the Insolvency Service and City of London Police do not have the same information we now have and must have had it for years. If, they, if you haven't got this information, then what have you been doing? for the four and a half years that this investigation has been ongoing. So as I say, if I can piece all this together, one person in my spare time, how on earth, it's inconceivable they couldn't. And when I say it's, it's not just me, because again, I, I wanna say that the incredible victims, I, I don't like using the word victim, but unfortunately this is the only word that aptly describes what's happened here. You know, and, and and also a group of uh, of like-minded individuals, some of whom are on this call uh, today, who have been instrumental in doing their own work and sharing their work with me, so that we can piece together the full uh, picture. So, despite all this evidence of a Ponzi scheme and fraud, yet the FCA and Solvency Service, City Run Police, all refuse to take action. All continue to conceal and suppress the evidence, and incredibly seek to exonerate the fraudsters and the seven, a, seven FCA authorised firms that were involved to conceal the FCA's own failures and their prior and ongoing dishonesty. Because I can't, I cannot think of another reason why the FCA would be doing this. And we've got plenty of evidence now to suggest that the first criteria for the FCA, when they get a case in the door, how exposed are we? And everything the way the FCA has acted in respect to this is, is, very, is consistent with that. So enough is enough. And I'm literally, and I, I want to direct this to Andrew Griffith and the Treasury Select Committee. Enough is enough. There must now be a full inquiry and like there was for LCNF and the victims, but, but importantly, victims have to be compensated now and before the inquiry even begins because liability and dishonesty by those public bodies has been clearly established. I mean, and I challenge anyone, if you want to come at me or, or take me on and say that anything I've said is false, by all means do so, you can't. It's all evidential based. So an inquiry has to take place. But the compensation like LCNF investors got because of the FCA failures has to be paid now and beforehand. And then the FCA can be at risk and the HM Treasury can be at risk for any losses not recovered. If they recover any losses, fine. Keep it and offset it against the amount you pay out. But there has to be an inquiry and the compensation must go to investors now. Because we I mean, every other week I'm I'm hearing news that one of the 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 pensioners or investors has has died or passed away. How many more are going to have to do that before justice is done? When um, uh, football index collapsed, and by the way, another thing where the FCA for 2018, yes, it's it's within our perimeter. 2019, yes, it's within our perimeter. 2020, yes, it's within our perimeter. March 2021, yes, it's it's within the FCA perimeter. Investment collapses in April 21, 100 million plus lost. The FCA immediately go to external counsel and get an opinion. No, no, no. It was never, never. It was never an investment product. You know, so they literally for three years said it was. And as soon as it collapsed with losses, then sought to conceal their own findings. And, and that was only uncovered because it was part of the Gambling Commission and the Department for uh, uh, Media and Culture and Sport who oversee the Gambling Commission ordered an immediate inquiry in the May. And the, the, and the findings were delivered by September, like four months. Enough's enough. Inquiry now. Let Dame Gloucester do it because she can then obviously then highlight and investigate the parallels with LCNF. But investors and the victims need to be compensated now. Liability is it's done, right? It's in the bag. Compensate people now. FCA, put your hand up. People, heads should roll if, if need be. 
But let the FCA sit in London Police and Summit Service, we all drop the ball on this, we all sort to sit, conceal and suppress it. You run the risk of not recovering money, not the victims. Enough's enough. So I'll end it there. Paul, thank you so, so much. That was absolutely, absolutely uh, remarkable. L ladies and gentlemen, before we do anything else, please put our hands together. You can just imagine the amount of time, effort and mental energy that went into that. It really was outstanding, Paul. Thank you so, so much. Thank you very, very much indeed. What we're going to do now, folks, we're going to give Paul a chance to catch his breath while Mark Bishop, who is like Paul, a long-standing member of TTF, Mark Bishop's going to give a, a brief kind of um, exact summary overview of the key key points. Uh, we'll then um, we'll then sort of move to pass to uh, Q and A discussion because it looks like many of you want to, a chance to say other things. But Paul, that was superb. Mate. Thank you very 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 much indeed. Well done. Well done. Um, well done. Mark Bishop, to you, please. Just if you can give us sort of a few minutes, please, Mark. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Andy, and thanks very much, Paul, for your forensic presentation and underlying investigation, and above all, for your persistence and bravery. Um, frankly, if only those qualities were present in the same quantities in some of the people who work at the FCA, we wouldn't be having this discussion now. There'd be no need for this symposium. It seems to me that there is a problem there with the culture of that organisation and some of the hiring decisions. It does seem to me very clear that the FCA's initial claim it had no powers to investigate were wholly wrong. It's not least clear by the fact that they now admit they have got those powers. It's pretty obvious as well that further evidence came to light while the scam was still operating and that the regulator still failed to act appropriately. It's difficult to believe that that was mere incompetence. Also, it's now admitting that it has the powers uh, but strangely, it's wary of saying that it's finding wrongdoing. I think we should ask ourselves why that might be. Well, of course, if the FCA admits that there is wrongdoing now, then it must be inferring that its failure to act back in the day meant that it failed to protect consumers. And morally, at least, that means it's on the hook for their losses. It's much easier to say we investigated and we found nothing. Because if there was nothing there, there was nothing there back in 2017. And therefore, therefore there was no opportunity to protect consumers. And this same behaviour happened in the Connaught London Capital Finance cases and many others. The FCA's kind of argument that there was nothing to see means that consumers don't get compensated, that negligent and dishonest firms within the regulatory perimeter don't get banned, fined or prosecuted, and scammers outside the, outside the perimeter also do not get prosecuted. In other words, in order to protect itself, the FCA has to hang out consumers to dry, both those affected already and those that will be affected by the next scams to be enabled by the same people. So how can this situation be solved? It seems to me there's only one answer. Remove the FCA statutory exemption from civil liability so those who lose money through regulatory failure are compensated. Do that, and the minute the FCA realises it's dropped the ball, they'll pick it up, aware that the losses are racking up every day it takes them to close down the scam. And costs borne by the FCA are passed on to the industry via its levy. The industry doesn't want this open-ended liability, who would? So the industry will put pressure on the FCA to raise its gain, and it has a lot more sway than we do. Until this happens, people will keep getting scammed. And every scam victim tells dozens of friends and family, and of course, hundreds of thousands hear about it via the media. This scares away huge numbers of consumers from making legitimate investments in genuine schemes, because they realize that they can't tell what, which is the real one and which is the scam. And actually, we shouldn't blame them for that. It's not about their naivety or their lack of financial education, because of course, the FCA cannot tell the difference between a real investment and a scam. They can't. What chance? Us. So the public and the honest majority in the industry are paying the price for protecting a, a complacent or captured regulator and the scammers. This is a situation that has to end. Uh, we at Transparency Task Force are engaging now very closely with the Treasury and particularly with the current Economic Secretary to, to the Treasury, uh, Andrew Griffith, making the case for amending the Financial Services and Markets Bill to amend the FCA's exemption from civil liability. And a couple of things as well, other things as well, we want a genuine duty of care and we want also 
uh, the FCA to have a consumer oversight body that asks difficult questions and commissions things like independent reviews when there are regulatory failure cases, because at the moment the FCA can control those things itself and therefore it ends up you know, getting away with wrapped knuckles at the most. Uh, so those are things that we're asking for. If those things are granted, actually the honest majority in the industry will gain because consumer confidence will be boosted. The dishonest minority will lose out. The question for Mr Griffith, I think, is whose side is he on? Is he on the side of the grafters, the savers, or is he on the side of the grifters and the criminals? I very much hope he's on our side. We're soon going to find out. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Paul. Mark, thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you very much indeed, Mark. That was a great, great summary. Very thought-provoking as always. Um, Paul spoke about enough is enough, and he's right, isn't he? Yeah? Enough is enough. Uh, we've seen enough of the same kind of um, opacity and obfuscation and exclusiveness uh, from the FCA. It really ought to put its hands up when it gets it wrong and put its efforts into putting things right, not trying to maintain a narrative that it didn't drop the ball in the first place. I wonder how much of the FCA's energies and resources are going into trying to stop people like us and Paul getting to the truth as opposed to being out there trying to catch the bad guys and to regulate the bad actors. Enough is enough. We'll end the formal part of our session there. So thank you very much indeed for your attendance tonight. For those of you that want to stay on for a bit longer, um, I suggest we have another five, ten minutes or so of informal conversation just to capture any thoughts at the front of people's minds but we will be wrapping the formal session up there thank you okay formal session over um, i'm going to ask everybody that wants to say something to say whatever you want to say as succinctly as possible um, but once again paul that was absolutely superb please raise your hand digitally or otherwise folks if you want to uh, raise a point we've got a few hands have gone up we're going to go to hugh beaumont first then Paul Birch, then John Hayworth. Please folks, as short as you can to give everybody a chance to say what they want to say. Hugh Bowman, we've only known you for a little bit of time, but you've already made a very worthwhile contribution to the cause for which we thank you. Hugh, uh, briefly you. introduce yourself and then make your point, thank you. Yeah, hi, I've worked in uh, the financial services markets for some 40 odd years in total, but I came across uh, evidence relating to Blackmore and uh, tried to go to the FCA, got no response. And uh, then my MP, Peter Gibson in Darlington, referred me to Andy. The rest is uh, history. Um, my my um, questioning is a fantastic presentation, Paul. Absolutely enlightening. And the summary, Mark, as well. Really appreciate that. But there are seven authorised parties. But I'd add to that. With the money that came into the Blackmore mini bonds, they should have had client accounts ring fenced with whoever they banked with. And uh, maybe the money came in via a UK bank, maybe it was an offshore bank, but either way I'd have thought European rules would apply. And perhaps the investors lawyers may want to consider that. The, um, is it NCM, the fund services company that's authorized by the FCA? Um, they fail to uh, uh, deal with the brochure, let alone any other material. They have professional indemnity insurance. And again, any lawyers acting for groups of these investors might want to look at pinging action against them, if only for fanning the publicity in the media to pressure the FCA or the Treasury to cough up. So that's enough. I won't say any more, but I think there's seven or eight yeah. authorised companies, maybe even the lenders. Uh, is it, uh, Paul, you mentioned 18 million um, was charged to these properties. Well, those lenders would do due diligence. And if they did due diligence, they'd be asking what happened to the investors' money. And if they didn't do due diligence, they were negligent. And uh, maybe there's potential claims there, enough to ruffle the feathers again. Enough for me, enough for us. Hugh, thank you very much. I honestly think that if you would be kind enough to send Paul an email with a few key bullet points as to what you've just said, yep. he could probably turn that into two or three additional 
lines of inquiry in terms of slides. Thank you so much, Hugh. Okay, Thank and you. I apologise I have to go. I have a son that's been bleeping. He's waiting at Darlington Station, having got yeah. back from London at 7.30. I said I'd be there or thereabouts. I better go. Okay, <laughs> so thank, thank you. Go. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Cheers, Hugh. We're now going to go to Paul Birch. Uh, Paul, in some ways, reminds me of Paul Carlier. Uh, Paul Birch is remarkably tenacious. An avalanche of insight and challenge comes from Paul Birch. I have the pleasure of getting some of his emails. Mr. Paul Birch, briefly introduce yourself and make your point. Thank you. You might be on mute, Paul. <laughs> oh, Paul, we have this every time. There we go. The bottom left hand corner one that looks like a microphone, Paul. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> um, right. Um, I will get to hang this one day. Um, I basically am a cure ops victim, and um, so many of the parallels that Paul has um, mentioned today are common to me as well. But he did mention about um, the memorandum or memoranda of understanding. And this is a point I brought up recently with Dave Eaton at the um, Executive Casework Unit at the FCA, because um, just before Andrew Bailey left the FCA as CEO to be appointed or promoted to the Governor of the Bank of England, he countersigned a memorandum of understanding between the FCA, the Bank of England, and the Malta Financial Services Authority. And... Um, in my particular case, I've been backwards and forwards saying, you know, why have the FCA and the MFSA and so on not taken any action? And I quote now from an email I received from Dave Eaton on the 18th of January. And I quote, on your point regarding the memorandum of understanding between the Malta Financial Services Authority and the FCA, the MOU does not create any obligation or authority for the FCA to take action in respect of firms outside of the UK, nor does it, nor does the MOU create any obligation or authority for the FCA to direct the MFSA to investigate or to initiate an investigation. What on earth have presumably hundreds of thousands of pounds been wasted on? if these MOUs are not even worth the paper they're written on. It just beggars belief. And just another example of how the regulators will do anything they can to absolve themselves of any responsibility. Thank you, Mr. Birch. Thank you. And we'll now go to John Hayworth. Uh, John, please briefly introduce yourself and make your point. Thank you. Yes. OK, thank you, Andy. Um, I find myself in very revered uh, financial industry company here this evening. I'm nothing much to do with it, apart from historically having been a, a soft target for it. Uh, I left the UK in really 1989. I worked in the Middle East most of the time, the 30 years that it was developing. I'm, I'm sitting here <laughs> around a table uh, in the northern France at the moment, having more or less retired. Uh, but I do have a rather strong sense of what's right and what is wrong. I wrote a rather long thing in the chat there because I'm trying to all the time uh, generate uh, people thinking about the wider picture, the bigger picture, the bigger picture and the bigger picture. And all the massive amount of work that uh, Paul has done, absolutely fantastic. I um, I deliberately rewound the 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 panorama in order to find out who is this guy and what's his name and I've been following you Paul ever since a couple of very quick comments one as you opened you talked to I obviously cannot send letters to MPs I don't have an MP it did suddenly um, it did sort of strike me that maybe that some MPs are going to be more receptive to letters like that than others and that uh, you might whether there's any any point at all in directing people or over that, I don't know, you know, but your MP is your MP, okay. But uh, uh, certainly those in constituencies of those MPs who are far more, uh, let's say, active in all of this uh, certainly need to be doubly and trebly encouraged, uh, at least. Um, that was one thing. The next thing was, um, I happened totally by accident. I never watched TV during the day, but I was fiddling around setting up some recordings. I fell into BBC One this morning and a programme called I think it was called Defenders or something. 
And in there was uh, a bit of a story about uh, pension scheme frauds. I didn't really pay a lot of detailed attention to it, but the, there is stuff still going on on the TV is what all I'm trying to say. You've had a big uh, show there around the panorama thing. There's tons and tons of scope for a whole lot more. Uh, and the particular group that I'm involved in, it's a totally separate thing. I never see it mentioned very much occasionally in the press, but it's bigger than, it's as big and if not bigger than many, many of what I've been hearing about both here and, uh, and on the TV. And, and it makes me think, hang on a minute, you want to approach the, the Treasury and people very high up in there in government and all the rest of it. There is a massive, absolutely massive scope here uh, to, to, I mean, far too big to investigate by, uh, you know, what's the word? Not, I won't say amateurs, but uh, unpaid professionals with a sense, a strong sense of uh, right and wrong. But there's a massive amount of other stuff still uh, buried under the carpet as, as far as the FCA can do it. And that's what the FCA are trying to do. And every time Paul says, I did this and I presented with this and yeah, and the story changes. And I'm just sitting here kind of half smiling, thinking, yeah, they're trying to cover up the tracks again. So, oh, my God, he's caught us here. We're going to have to uh, think of something else, fellas. And they're now getting to the stage where they're running out of road. I think you're right, John. Thank you very much. And, um, Finally, uh, there are so many other cases. Yeah, that was my other note. So I've said that. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. But a great presentation, as usual, from Paul Carlier. Many thanks. And uh, all, all a good best of luck to everybody in the TTF. I'll try and support you and pass the word on. We'll talk about this elsewhere, uh, Andy, but um, yeah, great. I think there is, there is possibilities there. Good. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, thanks a lot. I'll switch myself off. Thank you, John. OK, we've got time for one more before we go to Paul Carlier for final comments from him before we wrap up the session. Does anybody have anything else they would like to share? I'm going to go to gallery mode. Wave a hand at me if you do. Otherwise, oh, Lisa King. Lisa, lovely to see you, Lisa. I didn't notice you there. Hope you're well, Lisa. Please, uh, please share your thoughts, Lisa, and then we'll go to Paul. Am I off mute? You are, Lisa. How lovely to see you, as always. Hello, thank you, Andy. I just wanted to say I've watched the presentation and um, it's really sad what's gone on. But the, what I want to say, if you bear with me, all the evidence that Paul Carlier has submitted to the FCA would have, would have, is truthful and he does very fantastic work and he tried to help myself and my late husband but what the FCA did is the evidence he produced to help my late husband and myself they used it against him and us Mm. They, they used my husband as collateral damage to destroy Paul Carlier's reputation. And I just wanted to say that is how low the FCA will go to protect themselves and their senior managers. They would rather let an innocent victim suffer <laughs> as my husband did than admit their mistakes. However, I've recently received internal information that was withheld from me, where the FCA investigator upheld my complaint about the way my husband was treated. However, the senior manager told them to change it from upheld to not upheld. And that senior person worked at the bank yeah. that destroyed my husband yeah. because of the revolving door between the FCA, the FOS and the banks, this continues to happen. And I just wanted to say, whoever's watching this or whoever will watch it, they have to admit when they've made mistakes, the regulator, and not use 
the victims, as, as, as I said, collateral damage. And when they are presented with ex fantastic information and evidence by Paul Carlier, don't use the victims to destroy him. He's doing his job. He's doing to help people. He's doing it because he's a genuine person and everyone else is suffering. And I just think it's disgusting, absolutely disgusting. That's all I wanted to say, Andy. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Lisa, thank you so much. Thank you so much. You, you're, you're so forthright and you're so sincere. Uh, are, are any of your are, are, are any of the boys with you tonight? Have you got your son with you tonight, Lisa? Are you alone? No, they're, they're out. They're out. They're, okay. They've gone to the gym. Okay. I'm going to give you a call just after this session ends, okay? If you don't mind, I want to have a, I want to have a quick chat with you about something before. Okay, okay, before, okay, Andy, thank you. thank you, and thank you, Paul Carlier. Rock, rock on to that, rock on to that, Mr. Carlier. Um, you're you're having a wonderful impact, a wonderful impact, Paul. Uh, there's a there's a great film. Um, it's the old black and white one when. Oh, what's his face becomes a uh, a fairy, not a fairy, an angel. Uh, what's the film I'm talking about? It's um the, the really famous one where it's, it's a wonderful, a wonderful life. life. Yeah. There we go. It's called It's a Wonderful Life. Have you all seen It's a Wonderful Life? If you haven't seen It's a Wonderful Life, you must. The reason I'm mentioning It's a Wonderful Life is because it's a lovely old black and white film, and it's basically about a man being given a chance to compare the world with him and the world without him. And he's able to see from the perspective of an angel what the world would be like if he wasn't around. And Paul, I know you're getting the message I'm giving you here, sir, that you are having a wonderful, wonderful, positive impact on many people's lives. And I think that once again deserves a round of applause. And Lisa has just proven it. Lisa's just proven it. Thanks, Paul. Back to you for your final thoughts. And we will wrap up in a few minutes. Mr. Carnier. I mean, first of all, I'd like to just like just pick up on what Lisa said. I mean, um, you know, Lisa's recently done a DSAR to the complaint commissioner. And like I did last year, Lisa's got a whole bunch of documents that the complaint commissioner disclosed that the FCA should have disclosed, but withheld. Um that includes we uh, quite astonishing stuff. I mean, I I was helping Lisa and Peter back in late 2017 and into 2018. We found significant evidence of fraud by Lloyd's um, and TLT, the lawyers that represented them, um, and you know they they were banged to rights and they had literally lied and cheated for for six years, um, and you know even to the point where we thought we discovered they withheld information you know we forced disclosure um and we found evidence to show that the lawyers had withheld a DSAR response so that they wouldn't have the information before a repossession hearing on their house you know even though you know so they literally withheld the information until the day after the hearing um it was astonishing they claimed throughout that Peter had never once asked for a, a lower interest rate mortgage yet we got the recall recordings in the end that uh, proved that because Peter was diagnosed with ME in January 13. He was a cab driver, so obviously couldn't work, but he phoned the bank, did everything right. Phoned the bank before he'd missed the payment, told them of his diagnosis, confirmed that his income was going to obviously suffer. Um, and he, his words were, and I've got the recording of the, you know, so I'm calling you for your guidance. Then the bank misled him into taking a payment holiday uh, and basically where, and he, raised concerns on the call that well that won't that leave me in arrears oh yeah but it's fine we, it, it, you know we won't ever come after you for it and he was swaying he didn't want to do it and they said no, no don't worry this take the payment holiday then after that there's more things we can do and that was and then we got the the transfer call you know where if you put on hold while they transfer you we've now we then got that call where the guy that peter had been speaking to and who peter had declared he was vulnerable transfers and i said just give him a payment holiday they literally, in that one thing, they determined, right, screw him, give him a payment holiday. And this guy was then just trying everything. He said, there's only two things we can do. We can give you a payment holiday or extend the term. No, the other thing under F MC FCA, MCA, 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 is give, let them switch to a, uh, an alternative uh, 
mortgage product, which would lower the costs. Um, and having said that there's more things they could do to take a payment holiday, Peter reluctantly agreed. And then as soon as the payment holiday was finished, they went, you know, they came off, they, they were off them for the arrears. And then they refused to allow Peter to switch to a lower rate mortgage because he was in arrears and it was bank policy not to allow customers in arrears to switch mortgage product. They literally trapped him, deceived him into taking the mortgage holiday. So it would create the arrears that they would then use to keep him trapped on a 5% mortgage instead of bringing his mortgage costs down from 1250 to 750 pounds, which was entirely doable at the time. The, we then, we, we then, I mean, it's, I, I'm, I'm trying not to laugh because it is incredibly upsetting, it, but it's so inconceivable that it is, it's comical. And when we forced the disclosure of evidence, the court, the key call recording that we, they had withheld, what we forced disclosure of, came in a whole list of files and they deliberately changed the file number and the date so that we wouldn't pick up on, you know, the significance because what we were looking for was certain files on, on, on a key date. And it's impossible to change for that file name to have been changed accidentally. When we presented all the evidence to the FCA in um, February 18, and I had it all articulated, all presented as a formal complaint and everything else, the FCA, the Ombudsman came back and went, and literally we said, we've got nowhere to go now, they have to uphold this complaint. The Ombudsman came back and just went, no, um, you know, I'm dismissing this case on its merits without consideration of its merits. I, I say I'm dismissing this case entirely without consideration of its merits. They actually put that in writing. The FCA said, after numerous reports, uh, interactions with Bailey's office and the submission of the formal complaint with all the evidence, Bailey's office came back and said, we don't get involved in individual complaints. That was February 2018. And it was only because I managed to get, with help from an H plus Reading victim, help Peter and Lisa get legal representation, <laughs> that the lawyer then articulated the complaint that I put together all the evidence and added some great stuff of his own, sent that to Bailey at the FCA and Lloyd's and within three months settled the 40 grand in arrears wiped out and the 140 grand in legal costs that they had added to their mortgage wiped out as well. Now they don't do that if they know they're not the wrong, but we alleged that Bailey, because we were tipped off, Bailey had written to the Lloyd's to tell them to, after he got the letter from the lawyer, just basically set, not, not for any other reason, but to conceal their failures. The FCA denied that Bailey wrote to Lloyd's. In the complaint commissioner DSA response release has got, there it is, black and white, Bailey wrote to Horta Rosario and said that, you know, uh, he was concerned, that following our, our call, I'm concerned about the heavy handedness and the way in which this customer is being treated. Now, you know, but he wasn't doing it out of interest, at least in Peter's interests. He was doing it to save his own ass because this was now going to go to court. And we had this letter that implicated the FCA in the terms of their dishonesty and concealment. And all this about one, and Peter, will, Lisa, I know gets very upset by this, and I do, I was fuming. In, in, in August 2017, they announced a mortgage dress scheme, 300 million. And basically, it was for the way the bank and the FCA come up with this thing for customers that were in payment difficulties got treated badly. And, you know, it, and it, listed all these things, 300 million quid, 529,000 victims, they said, and the bank confirmed that Peter was one. And it was supposed to cover all consequential losses and everything else, but the bank was put in charge of all damages. Now their damages by this time were 180 grand in the legal fees and the arrears that had accrued. And the arrears were literally almost to the penny, the difference between paying the 750 pound a month they could have done had they been a switch mortgage and the, the ridiculous one they kept them on. So, um, um, now they they said Peter qualified. They offered him four hundred quid. That was the damages. So they were marking their own homework. However, the FCA had said well, we only get we don't get involved in individual cases, and they didn't disclose the the final. Didn't publish the final notice against Lloyd's for all this crap until June twenty twenty. And in there, it confirms that they knew this shit had been going on since two thousand thirteen, and they knew there was five hundred thousand victims. And the FCA told us. They wouldn't don't get involved in individual cases. And they told us that knowing that Peter was one of 500,000. And they not only that, they knew it had been going, they revealed it. We went in in 2013, we found all of this going on. Lloyd said to us in 2014, we put it right. The FCA went back in in 2015, found the same shit going on. They hadn't done it. And the FCA never disclosed that to, to Peter Release. They knew that they were victims, but somebody, a former colleague at Lloyd's, 
called me out the blue one day. And this is where what Lisa, Lisa alludes to, and I've now got internal documents from Bailey's office that backs this up. They said to me, are you helping a mortgage prisoner victim? So I went, yeah. And I hadn't spoken to this person since I'd left Lloyd's. And he said, watch your back. They're going to use this to end you. Now, it was a really odd thing to say, but he knew the details. He knew the name of the customer. And he was well placed within the in, in, in lawyers to do it. In a DSAR response I've now got, I've got evidence, internal emails from Bailey's office going out, and they're clearly designed, and they were designed to go to the APPG, Heather Buchanan. And they literally engineered a false narrative about me and were saying that basically trying to imply that I was giving bad advice. And they were trying to literally set me up for a fall to pin the, the costs and, and everything on Lisa and Peter on me. Because then they say, oh, you were acting on their behalf. You gave them bad advice and, and basically try and come after me with something. They would later come after me in March 2019 uh, with a witch hunt. Um, but it was quite clear. They were literally prepared to sacrifice Peter and Lisa, like let them lose their home. Because they, the bank got a repossession order under false pretenses. And the FCA knew it. And the FCA refused to respond, giving the green light to TLT and Lloyds to pursue the, the uh, repossession order that they knew was obtained by perjury and perversion of the course of justice so yes. it's i mean it sounds fanciful what what lisa, lisa's saying you think even you know that can't be it is and i've got the evidence to back it up and uh you know and peter suffered unnecessarily for so many years and we all know what the, the and the british heart foundation confirms what the the biggest cause of heart disease and everything else is is, is stress and peter endured five and a half well, it's the best part six years of stress <laughs> yeah all avoidable um and i don't believe for one second that it did not contribute to to peter's loss and and i do regard peter was a friend you know the time we spent together and everything else and you know i know they got a settlement in the end but they shouldn't have had to endure what they did and you know it's uh yeah it's a shocking shocking tale um but we'll call it for it is we we understand that and um and the harsh reality is that time doesn't heal the kind of hurt that's been suffered by Lisa and yourself and, and others. Uh, Lisa, I'm going to give you a call in a few minutes, OK? Uh, Paul, tonight's session was called uh, Black Mob Bond Post Panorama. What does it tell us about the FCA? Paul, would you be happy just to spend a, a couple of minutes, that's all, just sharing your sort of high level views about what you believe, what's happened since Panorama tells us about the FCA? What do you think it tells us about the FCA? I think the, I think the whole what it what it tells you is something that I've suspected for a long time, and I did allude to in the presentation that you know, the the FCA is constrained and handcuffed by its past failures and its past dishonesty. So what you have, and in Blackmore Bond, you know, you get a situation where August two thousand eighteen, I escalate everything up to Bailey and Stewart, and they've oh Christ, we dropped the ball. Right, okay. Instead of putting their hands up and saying we had dropped the ball, as I, as I said in there, that, you know, and in Panorama, they dishonestly then seek to bury the ball and the victims along with it. Now, if you go to the FCA with a, you know, they look at it, go, oh, we haven't dropped the ball in this one, bang, they'll, ex they'll exercise all their powers that they have. So it's not that the FCA don't have the powers, they're cherry picking when to use them. And their first criteria is to what extent are we exposed? And this is something that I and every whistleblower that goes to the FCA has. The problem you have. When you go to the FCA as a whistleblower or, or even someone like me who's just reporting something going on next door, there's no such thing as a unique or isolated fraud or scam or wrongdoing. If it's going on in one bank, it's going on in others. And if it's, if it's happening to one customer at one bank, it's probably happening to more. So the problem you have is that when you escalate your disclosures to the FCA, the chances are they there's, there's, it's one of two things is, is going to happen. Either you are reporting conduct that they weren't aware of and absolutely should have been aware of. So they kind of dropped the ball by not, it was going on under their nose and they weren't aware. Or yeah. it's conduct that they were aware of and had previously ignored. So in either scenario, you, without realising, are reporting something to somebody who's actually conflicted and potentially implicated by what you're reporting. And, you know, and th this is what's leading to these just gross, gross failures. But there's all, it's... It's for me, the worst thing is it's the just persistently changing narrative. Every time I expose one false representation, they come up with something else. And you know, and that was evident, that's been evident since since Panorama. And it's just like, 
you know, the FCA, uh, I, I put something up at the weekend. The FCA just last year won the IT industry award for <laughs> engagement. Like, oh, yeah. For I mean, that is quite something for a, for a body that absolutely goes out of its way not to engage. And I think that that's that's the problem. I think that the, the, they're, they're constrained by conflicts. Historic failure predetermines a, an outcome and guarantees further failure. And, uh, you know, the whole thing needs overhauling and, you know, and there needs there needs to be punchier oversight. Uh, you know, it's uh, you know, it's all well and good, Dame Gloucester having these findings. But as we know, uh, the two, two of the principal people involved got promoted initially after it i mean you know and and one one other thing as well i want to finish on this this is something i attended an appg event before christmas at parliament now those of you some of you may not know but karen baxter former uh commander of the city of london police the country's foremost economic crime unit and where all four goes to die um she's now at the fca in in enforcement an exec non-exec director in enforcement advisor to steward and the, and the gang there now she said at, and this is i found it astonishing she said at the appg event what we found is that most fraud victims aren't really interested in prosecution they just want their money back and she was usually just like well would we yeah we'd like to but that's our priority getting the money back well i guarantee you that's false and here's why it's false because I guarantee you that every future fraud victim would rather you would have prosecuted in the first place the previous frauds. Because if you prosecute the previous frauds, there's less chance of a future fraud happening. Because you take the frauds off the street and you alert other fraud potential fraudsters to the well, there's a consequence here. As it stands, it's fair game. So this, if Karen Baxter is adopting that policy at the, F, at the FCA, it explains a hell of a lot about what she did or, or why the city of london police was so ineffective when under her stewardship uh when she was there um and if when you when you look at things through that lens that she's it kind of makes sense they're not worried about going after you know if they can find a way or engineer a way to get people their money back yeah they do it's just nonsense you know and um but and ironically she admitted or she said to me she admitted the system was broken and when i said you will you know, engage with people like me she said no, you're not qualified. She, she actually said that and said, well, so I said, well, hang on. I'm the one that keeps exposing problems and flaws and doing work that clearly isn't being done. How am I not qualified? And she was adamant that the only people that can change the broken system are the people in the broken system. And I, my point to her was, but you allowed it to get broke and you did nothing. So if you don't know how, if you didn't see it getting broken, how can you know what the problems are? If you don't know the problem, how do you know the solution? I use an, and I'm going to leave it right here. Uh, I use an analogy all the time. A sat nav is an incredible piece of equipment. And if you want to know how to get somewhere, great. But that needs to know where you are now. Because if it doesn't, if you don't put in where you are now, or it doesn't know where you are now, it's, it's fucking useless. It's apps completely ineffective. And that's where we have in the system of high, uh, oversight right now. The FCA has no clue where it is. Neither the city of London place or anybody else. So yeah, I'll leave it there. Well, thank you very much. And um, my hunch is that they don't know where they are because knowing where they are would force them to reveal the harsh reality of the many and various failings that have happened. Um, we've done it once, we've done it twice, we've done it three times, we're going to do it a fourth time. Can we please once again show our appreciation to Paul Kylie? And thank you very much, Dick. Well, well done. And uh, folks, Find a way to watch that movie. It's 1950s black and white stuff. It's got a lifetime's worth of wisdom in it. It's a wonderful film. Um, the film is called It's a Wonderful Life. And the reason I want you all to watch it is because it's a nice reminder of the little bit of positivity we can bring to other people's lives, particularly uh, Paul Kyler and people like him. Thank you all very much now. Yeah.